we are the last ones to cite polls, um, <laughs> uh, but that's when it comes to presidential candidates. Right. That's Talk wise. about some of these new polls that are coming out around the climate crisis, whether we're talking about in this week uh, called Covering Climate Now, right. that many of us are involved with, collaborating on media organizations around the world. CBS came out with a new poll. And then Scientific American on children and what they believe. Oh, well, that was a poll. Um, Scientific American, I think, was reporting um, on, a, uh, on a study in Nature Climate Change about the impacts that that young people are having on their parents' belief in climate change. So I think this growing sense of urgency that you see really clearly in many of the polls, including most recently the CBS poll, um, where people are defining climate change more and more as a crisis, they want politicians to act. That's very different. You know, when I when, when I was um, doing this research just a few years ago, it was it climate change would reliably be listed last among Democrats. Like so, people not not people who are denying climate change. They say, yes, I care about climate change, but you ask them to rank it, and it would rank, like, 19th or 20th, among other other issues of concern. Um, that's really shifted. And I think it partly it's because of lived experience. Um, partly it's the clarity of the scientific messaging that we're getting, from, particularly from the, from the IPCC, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, speaking in a language people really understand, you have, you know, 11 years left. Uh, to transform virtually every aspect of society. That's a quote from their summary, from their 1.5 report. Um, and also, I think so many young people are really living with climate grief, with climate terror, and they're turning to their parents, and they're saying, what you have to do something about this. And and this is now, now it's become clear that, that young people, particularly young girls, are changing the views of their parents. And that's where the Scientific American yeah. article begins, mm -hmm. was about um, children, uh, particularly girls, um, having an effect on conservative fathers, which is so interesting. Yeah. We want to turn right now to a young woman, to a girl, to Greta Thunberg. On Monday night, Amnesty International presented its 2019 Ambassador of Conscience Award to the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future movement. This is Greta speaking last night. Right now, I think there is an awakening going on. Even though it is slow, the pace is picking up and the debate is shifting. This is thanks to a lot of different reasons, but it is a lot because, because of countless of activists and especially young activists. Activism works. <laughs> so what I'm telling you to do now is to act, because no one is too small to make a difference. I'm urging all of you to take part in the global climate strikes on September 20th and 27th. And just one last thing, see you on the streets. Greta Thunberg receiving the Amnesty International World Word, um, Award from Kumi Naidu, the head of Amnesty International, who will be joining us later this week in our climate coverage. Um, um, Naomi, you had the chance to be on stage with Greta Thunberg at the Ethical Culture Society. Almost a thousand people packed in to see the two of you have this intergenerational conversation. Talk about her significance. She's here in New York and will per be participating in the global climate strike on Friday. Well, she's—I I, <laughs> love seeing her, and, and her moral clarity is so forceful. I think she's really a prophetic voice who has brought um, the, the existential urgency of the crisis to, to the heart of power. 
she isn't the first person to, to do that, right? And you have covered um, other young voices uh, on Democracy Now! in the past, particularly from the Global South. And, you know, I, I think about um, Kathy Jetner Kujenner from the Marshall Islands uh, speaking at the United Nations in New York, um, holding her nine month old baby, reading a poem to her, or Yeb Sanao, uh, Yeb Sanao at, the, at the UN Climate Talks uh, a few years ago, as Typhoon Haiyan is hitting his family home. He's negotiating on behalf of the Philippines. So these moments that sort of burst through the bureaucracy language with which we kind of shield ourselves from the reality of the stakes, the extraordinary stakes of our moment in history. Um, there are so many ways in which we use language to protect ourselves, and I think the people who are tasked with talking about climate change at the official UN conferences are very good at, at making it seem less urgent than it is. I don't think they mean to, but, you know, careers in, in, in bureaucracy manage to do that. So there have these been these voices before who have pierced through from the Global South. Unfortunately, it's mainly been Democracy Now! who covers them, um, and, 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 and very few other, uh, other media organizations. Greta has broken through, and, and she's such a, a, an amazing voice for her generation. Um, and. And, 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 and it's a very different voice, I think, in, in part because, as she, she, she talks about, what makes her different in, in her understanding of, of this crisis having to do with neuro neurodiversity. Um, she has a different way of seeing the world as somebody on the autism spectrum. And I wanted to go to the question you asked her. Why don't you set it up for us, hmm. uh, as you spoke from your own personal experience as well? Um, well, I wanted—I I was just asking her— about the tremendous sense of responsibility she must feel, because in, in, in very short order she's become the most prominent, it, it seems, voice on the on the climate crisis, or, or one of them. Um, but she's also, from what I can tell, the m most prominent voice of somebody who self-describes as being on the autism spectrum. Um, and she talks a lot about that. She's made a choice early on. And so I wanted to just get her reflections on that. So you spoke personally of your own experience. We're going to start with your question and then go into the answer. I wanted to ask you about this other responsibility that you've taken on, which has to do with being very public from the beginning about being on the autism spectrum. It was in your Twitter bio, um, climate activist with Asperger's. Um, and and that, that leads to a whole other level of responsibility, because you're probably also the most prominent person in the world right now who self-identifies as being, I'm sorry, being on the autism spectrum. And that's really, really important to people who um, <laughs> identify with you. <laughs> And I, I can speak uh, about that personally because I have a, a seven-year-old son with special needs and you are his hero. I really didn't think about being public of it because I just, it was in my um, profile and biography on social media and I didn't think about it. I mean, it was just, why should I not be public about that? Why should that be something? Do not be public about, but then I I sort of noticed that it was a big thing that to not many people were public about their diagnosis, but I just I just think it's so important to because still many people see see to have uh, a diagnosis to be neurodiverse, to be something negative, and it doesn't have to be. And of course, you, it can limit you in many ways. It has limited me a lot, um, but it can also, you can also convert that into be something good, something positive. And uh, that is what I have done, and that is what I think we should encourage more people to do. That's the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, Naomi. Um, yeah, I was I, as I've um, gotten to know Greta a little bit and, and, and thought about her impact. I, I am really struck by 
the way she talks about her, um, she talks about it as a kind of a superpower, right? That she has this amazing ability to focus, um, which is true for many people on the spectrum. You know, there are many people on the spectrum who are in the sciences, who you know, who who are amazing classical musicians. Um, but as Greta says, it's uh, not everybody has these uh, uh, the, these. Um, you know, there are a lot of struggles. There are a lot of challenges. Um, so it's not to romanticize it, but. One of the things that's really interesting is that um, therapists talk about how kids on the spectrum don't do something which most kids do, which is called mirroring, right? So most kids, like if you play a game of Simon Says, right, they get it right away. You, do, you, you, you move, I move, and we mirror. That's something that humans do. We're constantly mirroring each other. We're looking to one another for social cues to tell us how to act. That's how we build uh, relationships and cohesive communities. A lot of kids on the spectrum just don't have that instinct. They don't have that impulse. They just do their own thing. Right? Which is why they get bullied, because they are following their own path. So what's interesting to me as it relates to the climate crisis is that I think this, the fact that we do mirror each other <laughs> has become a huge problem, because we live in a culture, in an economy that, on the one hand, is telling us we're in the middle of this <laughs> existential emergency, and, you know, we see footage of, of, of Arctic sea ice loss, and uh, we hear about an insect apocalypse. We hear about a million species facing extinction. But then the next minute, it's like, well, go shopping, you know, watch a makeup tutorial on, on YouTube, imitate celebrities. So, and, and politicians talking about pretty much everything except for this, as Greta has said. So if your impulse is to mirror, you're getting very conflicting messages. You're like, is this a crisis or not? Because, uh, I, you know, I'm hearing a message that it's a crisis, but everywhere I look, I'm getting the opposite message. Everything is fine, continue as usual, keep the system going. And so I think what's so interesting about Greta, and she's not the only young person on the spectrum who is playing a leadership role in this movement, is that it's precisely because they lack that impulse to look to other people to tell them the right way to feel about this, that they trust their initial instinct. I don't know a kid in the world who doesn't who doesn't have their first response to the climate crisis being, oh, my God, why isn't everybody acting on this? Why isn't everybody understanding this as an emergency? The problem is then that the next wave of messages they get is a message of be reassured when we shouldn't be reassured. So I think that's part of why Greta is playing this prophetic role, because she trusted her first instinct, and she's not mirroring this insane society. <laughs> We're talking to Naomi Klein for the hour, senior correspondent at The Intercept. She has a new book out today called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. Back with Naomi in a minute.